So let me now introduce the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation is a postulate. It's a first principle. It's not something that can be derived. There's arguments about that. But um, so the Schrodinger equation is minus h bar squared over 2m e squared dx squared plus e of, oops, how do I have it? p operator of x. There's a Schrodinger equation. So this is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. What we have here, so this is called the total energy operator. Okay, And what it's going to be doing is operating on my wave function. Now the wave function contains all of the information in the system. It's not that the wave function necessarily says, OK, well, I'm always going to tell you, well, I'll stop there. Um, so the wave function contains all the information in the system. That's all you need to know for now. So what the total energy operator will do, it will ask via operations. So we operate on the wave function. And what that means is we take minus h bar squared over 2m d squared dx squared on the wave function plus this portion, so this is the kinetic energy. So notice that this says total energy operator. So here we have the kinetic energy component. Any guesses what that little P stands for? So this is the potential energy operator. So the total energy operator is, uh, is a combination of the kinetic and the potential. And what that does is it operates on the wave function. And then if the wave function is an eigenvalue or an eigenfunction, then operating on it with the total energy operator will yield those discrete energy states that we were after. But if and only if it yields the wave function back again. OK, cool? Everyone happy with this? So this is the total energy operator. And it has a fancy name. This is called the Hamiltonian. And so the Hamiltonian is specific to the total energy operator. But, and then if you actually, uh, for the different, so there will be a different wave function for the particle, uh, for a hydrogen atom, for a lithium atom, for a a particle bound to a box, for a particle bound to a sphere, for a particle or an electron. By the way, I'm a trained physicist, so I'm going to say particle even though I mean electron. Um, so all of these wave functions are going to be different depending on, this is getting annoying. Uh, so all of these wave functions are going to be different depending on, there we go. You can see me now. Wow, that's really dirty. OK. So all of these wave functions are going to be specific to our system. And our wave function contains all the information of our system. So we're going to go up to it. And we're going to ask it questions. And those questions we're going to ask the oper or, sorry, the questions that we're going to ask the wave function are, hey, what's your position? And we're going to ask it with the position operator. Or we're like, hey, wave function, what's your momentum? And we're going to use the momentum operator, which is equal to minus i h bar d dx. If I ask the wave function, hey, wave function, what's your position? And it'll be like, oh, here's the position of the particle that I represent. It's actually kind of like an agent. You know, you don't call the famous person. You call their agent and be like, hey, can I have lunch with this person? I don't know. I've never called to have lunch with a famous person. Whatever. But you would talk to the wave function in order to get information about the system that's going on. Um, and so the position operator is just x. The momentum operator is minus i h bar d dx. So if you wanted to know information about your wave function, particularly about the momentum, you would have to ask it, OK, well, what happens to you when I multiply you by i h bar with a negative sign d dx? 
Likewise, the total energy is for Hamiltonian, and it's given this fancy H symbol, and that's minus H bar squared over 2M D squared DX squared plus your potential. Oops. And this potential energy, hmm, this is where it gets hard. Um, this potential energy is going to change depending on if you have an additional potential energy. Initially, we're going to assume that the potential energy is going to be zero. So this is just going to disappear, and we're only going to be concerned about the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy operator is, uh, I think it's K, no, EK, and that's minus H bar squared over 2M D squared DX squared um, without this potential portion. And then the potential energy operator is just what this value is. Now this value is going to change for all of the different types of interactions. So you've got multiple electrons, you've got multiple protons, you've got a spring, you've got rotation. This is where it gets challenging. So what we're going to do is, um, so let me, let me just kind of give you a, an overarching view. We're going to dive into how do we determine the energy states of these different electrons in these, say, ground state energies, or the energy associated with the transition. Okay? In order to do that, we're going to start with very simple systems. We're going to start with a one-dimensional box with a particle stuck inside. And that means that we're going to take out that potential energy. Okay, and we're just going to look at how do we learn information when we have a wave function that represents that particle inside that box, and how do we learn information about its energy and its position and its momentum. When we do that, then we're going to start to add complexity. And we're going to say, okay, well now I've got that particle no longer bound to a box. It's no longer stuck inside a box. Now, it's stuck to, say, a ring. So you now have an electron orbiting because I just threw that, you now have an electron orbiting a, a central point. Then what we're going to do is we're going to make that three dimensions, and now we're going to have that electron bound to a sphere. Go team, see where I'm building towards? Then when we bound that electron to a sphere, let's put a, still no potential energy. It's just bound to that sphere, but we don't know how it's bound. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, what if there's a plus in that middle? What if the reason that that electron is stuck to that sphere is because there's a proton there. Now how do my energies change? When we do all of that, we're going to get a very fancy wave function. It's going to be called the spherical harmonic. Okay? And then when we take the three-dimensional mathematics of the spherical harmonic, guess what we're going to find? Those look familiar? Go team. So we're building towards the mathematics that's going to give us the atomic orbital shapes. 